As you're sitting down, I'd like you to think about what you think is the single most dangerous day of your life. So what is the single most dangerous day of our lives? Is the day we decide to take that fateful, fateful plane journey that ends in tragedy? The day we decide to go solar rock climbing? Or perhaps get lost in the sharky waters of the Atlantic? As we know, it's not that one. It's much more dangerous to be the shark. Bungee jumping, perhaps? In fact, it's none of those, and allow me to shed some light on the issue here. And the egg here is actually a clue. It's the day we're born. The very first day of our lives is the day that, that we have the highest risk of dying. In fact, the first month of life, and that's known as a newborn period, is exceptionally risky. And I'm here today to share with you the issue and bring to your attention the issue of newborn survival, why it's a global issue, how does it compare to other concerns we've talked about today and other great health concerns of our time, where it is an issue, and what some of the potential solutions could be for tackling it. So I'm going to ask you to trust me just on that statistic, and I'll come back to it. But I quickly want to run through you know, why I am standing on the stage with a blow-up doll, a newborn baby called Natalie. Yeah. Take care of it. So how did I end up being passionate about this issue? Trained as a medical student in Cape Town, my first year as a doctor in Namibia, where I was exposed to a healthcare system in a developing world setting. Went to Oxford to study public health, understand how health systems actually work. Felt pretty incompetent as a doctor, so I thought, well, let's try and change the system. Also did an MBA focused on social enterprise, trying to understand how can we use management strategies, business models to tackle social objectives. And spent three years with the World Economic Forum working with global leaders, building public-private partnerships on health, understanding international policies, international institutions, and funding flows for health. And the last few years I've spent with the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, exploring and having the privilege to meet people like our board member, Mohammed Yunus, and explore other models of social and environmental in innovation for sustainable approaches to some of the world's greatest challenges. It's really been a privilege. And I'll tell you, and you may read about it, that I'm quite passionate about social enterprise for two reasons. One, it's the cutting edge of social innovation. It's really showing us new ways to tackle the challenges that we've been exposed to today. But also, it's showing us new ways of doing business. So let's go back to Namibia. My first year as a doctor, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, hoping I would save many lives, some lives. Children in particular, that was my passion. And I remember that year doing 46 resuscitations trying to save the lives of 46 people, adults and children whose hearts had stopped or had stopped breathing. And I was only successful in one case. It was pretty shattering as a young doctor. And I remember one specific case was a newborn baby, a premature, small newborn baby, born early, from a village many miles away. It may have been this village. There is actually a village there on the way to Spitzkopf. I don't remember, but it was several hours' drive and it arrived wrapped in a newspaper and in a box. And I ran around doing all the investigations, was a really sick child, all the treatments I could think of and I was taught at medical school. My supervisor was on leave for two weeks, I was running this newborn neonatal nursery unit on my own. And within a few hours we lost that child. I lost that child. And it was for a simple reason that I had not recognized. Hypothermia. The baby just was cold. So I started looking at, okay, this baby wasn't transported in an incubator. Should have been kept warm. There are 25 incubators. At the time, there were 25 incubators in the entire country in the public health care system. For one in every six babies at, at, in that country that were born premature and needed incubators. So I started getting quite passionate about looking at what are the risks for newborns? So how dangerous is it really to be born? Well, like all things, it depends, right? It depends where you live. 
There are 136 million births every year, most of which are in low and middle income countries. In the UK, your risk of dying in the first month of your life is one in 333. For every 333 children, one baby dies. Actually, it still sounds like quite a lot, but actually that's pretty good going. In the private sector in South Africa, it's probably quite similar to that. In Somalia, for every 16 children that are born, one baby dies. And the discrepancy, like many things we've seen, is unacceptable. So you say, okay, well, I know a bit about statistics, right? What are the risks really here? There are 136 million births. That's a big denominator. In 2008, how does it compare to the you know, risk of flying? In 2008, there were 2 billion passenger flights and only 583 deaths. Sounds a bit like the risk of dying from a shock attack. It's one in 3.4 million. I'd rather take a flight than be born again. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't a religious comment. The reality is a newborn baby dies every eight seconds. You know what I'm doing. Another baby just died somewhere in the world. That's almost 10,000 innocent new lives every single day all over the world. How does this compare to the other great health concerns of our time? We know HIV AIDS still claims tragically 2 million people every year almost totally preventable. Malaria, another almost wholly preventable disease, claims 800,000 lives every year. Deaths in newborns, 3.6 million deaths. Add to that another 3.2 million stillbirths, those are deaths in the latter half of pregnancy, and you've got 6.8 million deaths that are mostly preventable. And we know what to do. There have been great strides in improving child mortality, and you will hear the Millennium Development Goals, and you'll hear measuring and comparing any country's progress, the child mortality rate being stated. It's the number of deaths of children, or the rate of deaths of children, under five years of age. Bill Gates calls this his favorite slide, and you can see why. It shows that investment in health works. We've reduced the number of deaths of children every year from more than 20 million deaths a year in the 60s to less than 9 million today. That is phenomenal. One of the best examples of why focus and attention on things like vaccines, diarrheal disease, better nutrition, improved hygiene, and improving economic progress of families can actually save lives. So there's the same graph, but with the rate of deaths. And you compare that to newborn deaths. You see the gains have not been as good. In fact, that's actually almost flat. There's been some recent progress, but if we really want to achieve the Millennium Development Goal targets, we need to start focusing on this issue of newborn care because it makes up 41% of childhood mortality. So all the things we're doing, vaccines, diarrheal disease, better nutrition, don't affect newborns. Vaccines only start at six weeks of age. Those of you who've had kids, you know the first vaccine you go for is at six weeks. We're talking about the first four weeks of life. So why is this not in all of our attention? You can just do a quick Google search and see that it's not in the world's attention. Having the privilege to come to TED and talk about this, I thought, well, how does this compare? HIV, you get 95 results if you search TED. Presentations and blogs. Malaria, similarly, 60 results. Newborn or neonate, no result matches your query. You can search for baby and get one or two results that are talk about things related to babies, but not about the issue of illness or deaths in newborns. And so it's really a privilege to be here today to talk about it for the first time that this issue has been raised at TED and on a number of platforms. And the fact that the theme here is nurturing the world one idea at a time, I thought I would do a small variation to raise the issue. Picture of my son being born with a double-barreled first name um, 18 months ago. And it's to remind me that there is good news and there's hope to hold on to. So the good news is that there has been a recent global momentum and movement in trying to raise awareness for this. Academics, researchers are starting to look at the issue, policymakers, international institutions, UNICEF, Save the Children, and governments are starting to actually take action. And there have been some very good examples. Malawi is one of them. A few simple interventions. 
And what the researchers have found is there are three major causes that cause 80% of these deaths. Okay, so let's focus, right? Prematurity, prematurity, the babies that are born small. Asphyxia, so some kind of starvation of oxygen or strangulation at birth, a complication at birth. And newborn infections, which are different to childhood infections later on. And these are the areas of interventions where we can start having an impact. And we know what to do in developed countries. We can reduce the risk to very, very little. But there's still a gap in trying to implement those interventions. There's a, this is a, just a slide that shows you where newborn deaths actually happen in the world and the size of the country is relative to those number of deaths. So you can see predominantly in South Asia and in Africa. And you compare that to where healthcare workers are, the ones who can actually help to intervene, and it's a total mismatch. We know low-income countries have very few resources and they're not going to get them anytime soon. So we have to be creative, we have to be innovative with the resources that we've got to tackle these issues. I'm going to talk about some of the solutions around prematurity, asphyxia, and infections. Coming back to Namibia, after my year of doing a master's in public health, I returned to implement a program called Skin to Skin Care. We've only got 25 incubators. Here is something developed in Colombia, studied in uh, Latin America, and actually quite a lot in South Africa. But it's nothing new. This is old technology, right? Conduction of heat, skin to skin. Amazingly, it keeps babies extremely warm. Lena here was born at 1.2 kilograms, extremely premature. A normal birth weight is at least over 2.5, if not 3.5 kilograms. Three and a half weeks later, she went home at 1.8 kilograms, was never in an incubator. Breastfeeding. And the research now shows that deaths can be reduced by half by using this. This is not a high-tech solution. It's not a low-tech solution. It's a no-tech solution. <laughs> but not everything is no-tech, and for some things, we actually need to determine certain measures to make decisions. And UNICEF, Save the Children and ourselves, and I'll tell you a little about a group that I've joined, have uh, been identifying what are the key gaps in technology that can help to save lives. One of them, we talked about these complications at birth, starving oxygen at birth, is monitoring the baby's heart rate. The World Health Organization has said every pregnant woman, every woman in childbirth should have the baby's heart rate monitored. Those of you who've had children, and those of you who are planning on having children, wouldn't dream of going through childbirth without measuring the baby's progress. That equipment is just not accessible or available. This is a graph of how the cost of drugs has come down dramatically in the developing world. Lots of public opinion pressure has been put on pharmaceutical companies, and they've reduced the price of essential and life-saving drugs such as ARVs for HIV in the developing world. The same hasn't happened yet with equipment. And if you look at Fortune 500 most profitable industries of 2009, it's totally under the radar. These guys, number one, medical products and equipment, more than IT, more than pharmaceuticals, more than oil and gas. There are some companies that are making good efforts. Lairdell that make uh, Natalie, who's been passed around, uh, make low-cost resuscitation equipment. And World Health Organization just last week uh, released this report saying how the opportunity and potential for medical devices to save lives. And the title of the report is Managing the Mismatch. The video that accompanies the report says, to save lives, medical devices need to be accessible, safe, effective, and appropriate. So I joined a team of experts, experts in newborn health, child health, and developing world, and technology pioneers to say, well, can we do this? And what were the design principles that we sat around and said, what, what do these devices need to have? Number one, they need to be low cost. They need to be ready, available, and accessible. We can distribute them. People can buy them. They need to be easy to use. A healthcare worker, regardless of their training, should be able to use them. They need to be safe and effective. If you want to make a good decision, you need accurate devices. They need to be robust. There's no maintenance in many of these countries. Certainly, you shouldn't have consumables. There's no supply chain for delivering all these disposables. And in settings like this, where this healthcare worker is visiting a mother and her newborn baby, they would be nice if they were energy independent. So the question is, can we design something like that? What's the answer? 
Yes, we can. There it is. The fetal heart rate monitor. I'm going to do this now. Is a low cost, robust wind up a medical device. This technology has been around for several decades. We're not doing anything new. We're just making it accessible and appropriate. I want to do a bit of doctoring here. Oh, normally you need to use ultrasound gel, which you can use, but that's a consumable, so this can work with water. I'm quite nervous. Those of you who um, will have had children will have recognized that sound. So I just want to show you a picture of it in use. This is a, a nurse using it in a clinic in South Africa. And uh, this clinic is actually run only by nurses. And what you see here is she's identifying what's the progress of this mother who's in early labor and trying to decide, you know, is it safe for this woman to deliver here? Or is this baby in trouble and we need to get it out, maybe refer her to another facility or actually do something uh, more drastic? WHO have also recommended that uh, uh, a standard device for all children with acute illnesses, including newborns with infections, should have oxygen monitoring. So we decided we'll develop an oxygen monitor as well. And these are the things if you go to any hospital casualty, they stick on your finger and they measure your oxygen supply. There we go, it gives you just what you need to know, the oxygen concentration and the pulse rate. And so you might feel a bit silly winding this up in a hospital where there is electricity. So there are other options, other power options. Uh, you can plug it into the adapter, charge it, and then it's good, good for use for several hours, go bed, bedside to bedside, no wires attached. You can go to the mobile clinic, but you can also use other opportunities to charge it, solar and even foot pump. And uh, we were lucky that our devices were shown in this new WHO video, and it's just a couple of pictures of it, clips from the video on uh, uh, it being used on a newborn baby. We recently shipped some of these to Haiti, and they're also in use in uh, Cambodia and Uganda and in South Africa. And here is a mother, uh, well, in early pregnancy, an expectant mother, uh, admitted to a clinic with clearly no electricity. This is our pet project. It's called Power Free Education and Technology. It's a South African nonprofit developing the devices and we're developing a company, a social enterprise alongside it to actually get it to market. It includes these luminaries, Professor John Wyatt, John Hutchinson, engineer from Freeplay, Professor Dave Woods and Dr. Joy Lorne. We won the Index Design Award last year for the fetal heart rate monitor. It's the largest Design for Life awards uh, in the world, uh, given in Denmark. Thank you. But just to also tell you and to highlight, you know, we've got education in our name, that these tools are not enough. We also develop uh, distance learning education that goes with the devices to help healthcare workers make the right decisions and also how to interpret these results. So we make life-saving devices, but the tools are not enough. You know, not one single piece of technology can really tackle this global issue, and I'm not trying to say that we're doing that. We've identified some key gaps, but it does require an integrated approach, and some of those things are happening. We're trying to fill one of those gaps. And so is it not our moral responsibility to be aware of this and to help bridge that divide and develop things like the fetal heart rate monitor? If we don't, Who's going to tell this father or this mother that their baby's heart doesn't count? Thank you.